Hi folks, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. Today I want to take a look at one of the most seminal papers in the field of optimizing compilers. As you can see from the title, what this paper does is list out a bunch of some of the most common optimizations that a compiler can perform. This was published back in 1971 and is absolutely foundational to the optimizations that compilers do. In fact, 80 to 90% of the optimizations that even a modern compiler does today are probably covered in this paper. The authors are Francis Allen, who unfortunately passed away just a few days before I'm recording this, who was the first female Turing Award winner. She won the award in 2006. Her co-author on this paper is John Cock, who was another Turing Award winner and received it in 1987. They both worked at IBM and spent most of their careers designing and implementing compilers. As they state at the outset, their goal with the paper is to systematize all the various ad hoc optimizations that compilers were doing. The goal of a compiler optimization is to make the compiled code faster. And while doing that, we explicitly sacrifice compile time. We recognize that since compilation is a one-time activity, it's okay to spend a little bit or a lot of extra time during compilation to make the resulting code faster. So let's dive right into the list of optimizations. The very first one is what they call procedure integration, but which many might recognize today as procedure inlining. And the basic idea is that if a program C calls another subprogram S, there are various ways in which S can get linked into C. The most common of which, and this is what we currently call procedure inlining, is to replace the call altogether with the body of the procedure getting called. The biggest advantage of doing this is that you can now optimize the two calls together. Since their bodies have been merged, you have a larger body of code to optimize together. And you can take and you can do all sorts of optimizations that are specific to the context of this calling pair. For example, if you only call S with a particular argument value, or you have various constant arguments, all of those can get folded in and then lead to many optimizations, which you would not have been able to do if you were simply calling S as a separate procedure. One of the biggest downsides of doing procedure inlining is that if you do it indiscriminately, you are going to blow up your code size. Another kind of corner case you have to be careful about when doing inlining is to make sure that special kinds of procedures that maintain a history or that do IO operations or all sorts of other stateful operations are inlined in a way that preserves their semantics. The next category of optimizations are loop transformations. And these are different ways in which you change the execution of loops to make them faster. One of the most common ones is loop unrolling. You could unroll a loop completely in that if you know the number of times the loop is being executed, you could expand that out into sequential code. Or you could unroll it partially by doing more work in each iteration of the loop and then reducing the number of total iterations. Why would you do this? What are the advantages of unrolling loops? The biggest advantage is that you are reducing the number of instructions being executed. So why would you do this? What are the advantages of unrolling loops? The biggest advantage is that you are reducing the number of instructions being executed by the loop. This shows up in two places, the number of index increments and the number of tests for loop control. If you, for example, unroll a loop by two, you're having them. If you unroll a loop completely, you've totally done away with them. And the next big advantage is that once a loop is unrolled, you have 
a longer stretch of code that you can then perform other optimizations on. For example, you could find pieces of the code inside that loop that when unrolled can be executed in parallel. Like many such optimizations, the major downside of doing this is that you increase your compiled code size. You also have to carefully look at the type of loop that you're unrolling. For example, if the number of iterations that you do around the loop is a variable, you have to be careful about testing the end condition for when the loop ends. The next optimization is kind of an inverse of loop rolling and it's called loop fusion. And the idea is if you have two loops one after the other that iterate the same number of times, you could merge their bodies and put them both inside one loop. For example, these two loops when fused together can get combined into one loop where their logic is inside the body of this one loop. The advantages of doing this are similar in that the loop overhead in terms of checking for control is reduced. In this case, you actually end up with a smaller size of code. And once again, you expose more instructions for local optimization within the body of the loop. They have an interesting example here in which these two optimizations are applied together. They have a matrix multiply program and what they do is unroll it by two and then do loop fusion. And what that ends up with is a program which multiplies two by two matrices in its inner body. And the inner body of the loop ends up looking like this, which looks pretty complex. But when you simplify this large body of code, you actually end up with a much simpler expression. So this is a great example of how when you have a larger body of code to optimize, you can then try to simplify it into something much shorter and much simpler. The next loop transformation is called unswitching. And the basic idea is that if within the body of the loop you have an if statement, you could actually take the if statement outside the loop and then perform two separate loops depending on the condition. Again, the trade-off is the same. You reduce the number of instructions executed, but you might increase overall code size. The number of instructions is reduced because you are not testing the condition of the if statement inside the body of the loop. You just test it once before you enter the loop. Now we get into the optimizations that work on basic blocks. What is a basic block? It is basically a sequence of instructions where control enters only at the top, the beginning of the basic block, and control exits only at the end of a block. And the reason basic blocks are important is that within a basic block, you know that control only flows linearly. And so you can do optimizations inside a basic block that you could not do otherwise when you don't know how control flows through the program. The next optimization that you can do is sub-expression elimination. The basic idea of sub-expression elimination is pretty simple in that if you can find a value that is repeatedly used and computed, you don't have to compute it multiple times. You could compute the result of that expression only once, store the result, and then use that stored result. For example, here's a program that computes A multiplied by B and uses it in a number of places. It does not actually need to do the multiplication all these times. You could just do it once and then use the value. You can also do a stronger form of sub-expression elimination in which you propagate equivalent values. For example, we're computing A into B over here. And now that we're assigning C to be equal to A, this next expression is redundant as well. So of course this is a net win because you're executing fewer instructions and not performing redundant calculations. You're also saving on code size. The only disadvantage of doing it is that you're increasing pressure on your registers. 
The next big class of optimizations is code motion. And the basic idea here is that you can move code around if it is safe to do so and if its use is not changed by moving it around. For example, if you are computing A into B inside the body of a loop, but those values don't change inside the loop, you could actually just compute it outside the loop and then use the value. And what you're trying to accomplish here is to move instructions from places that are frequently executed to places that are less frequently executed. So for example, from inside a loop to outside a loop. Constant folding or constant propagation is when you notice that some variable is a constant and replace code to look up that variable directly with the constant itself. One of the big advantages of constant propagation is that you can repeatedly apply it and then find other places to do constant propagation as well and in fact, if you realize that the condition of an if statement, for example, turns out to be a constant that is known at compile time, you can then eliminate one of the branches of that if statement. And that brings us to dead code elimination. Often when you repeatedly apply a bunch of optimizations, you'll end up with code that is never used. You'll find values that are computed that are never used, for example, or like we just saw, you can find control statements like if statements where the condition is known at compile time. So you can just eliminate one of the branches of that if statement. The next optimization is strength reduction. And the goal of strength reduction is to replace computations with equivalent computations that are simpler. The most common example of this is if you are inside a loop and you multiply the loop increment variable by five, multiplication is a relatively expensive operation. You could instead do a series of transformations and instead of multiplying by five, add five in each iteration around the loop, thus ending up with additions instead of multiplication. The next body of optimizations is instruction scheduling. And this is where the knowledge of the underlying hardware is particularly used by the compiler. The idea is to reorder and schedule instructions in such a way that it makes maximum use of the pipeline units of the processor on which it is executing. So you want to look at all the interdependencies between those instructions and reorder them in a way that every cycle you can start off executing an instruction. And you want to reorder them in a way that every pipeline unit is busy throughout. You can also optimize by changing how you parse various operations. For example, if you're adding four numbers A, B, C, and D, instead of adding A to B and then adding C to it and then adding D to it, you could add them two at a time. So add A and B, then add C and D, and then add the results of those two expressions. The big advantage of this is that the two sub-expressions can be added in parallel. So that was a whirlwind tour through some of the most common compiler optimizations that are still very, very important even in modern compiler. I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time. Thank you very much.